Hello, and welcome to this session. Today, we're going to talk about pre-registration and register reports, which are somewhat new, well, not the new, but at least some getting more popular practices in sharing the research earlier. I wanna start with a couple of quotes to kind of start with the reflection. This is a quote from Chris Chambers, who I'm not sure if he's the inventor, but at least he has been maybe the greatest promoter of register report you know, over the past 10 years. And he's writing, he's tweeting that if you want your results to determine whether your work is published, then you should submit a regular article. But if you're tired of editors imposing publication bias and want your work to be judged because of the quality and not because of the glamour results, then you should submit a register report. And more recently, Horizon Europe, which is sort of the next stage of the Horizon 2020, they have a section related to early and open sharing of research and pre-registration register report are mentioned as tools for basically uh, sharing the, the research process even at the idea stage so even before the actual data collection the actual data analysis and writing the paper happens so of course if we think of the horizon europe right now it's a recommendation and you will understand that register report and pre-registration do not fit all possible types of science but in general uh, even even in the case that kind of hypothesis testing is not the type of work that you do, there is still an advantage in pre-registering basically your idea, kind of what you basically would do with a grant application where you claim that you're going to do something. These kind of claims can even be registered. You get the timestamp, you get kind of, you know, I claimed to do this first, even though maybe in, in the end you couldn't do it or whatever. So I paste again the materials, and this material will hopefully become a part of auto.fi for documentation purposes. You can improve it by commenting directly on this web page. And as you can see here, if you are contributing, I hope you are fine that the license will be CC by 4.0. So to start with the references, if you are too busy and have to leave immediately, uh, this article from last November is a great overview from historical point of view and what's the situation right now on with the register report. So it's a, it's a highly highly recommended if you are planning to work with register report and it's a it's a quite a light article. It does not too it doesn't take too long to read. However, you can get even a faster overview with the set of slides, Chris Chambers. Uh, as used in a few years ago. Things haven't changed that much. Register report have been around for almost 10 years. So you can still get um, most of the information that I'm actually using in this page is based on those on those slides. This other, all the sets of slides is really good because there's a series of um, limitations and kind of concerns related to register report. So it's good as a material for for thinking when is suitable and when maybe it's less suitable. And in the Center for Open Science, you get uh, lots of lots of materials, templates, all the list of journals. Right now, there's more than 300 journals that accept register reports, basically covering any field. So this is a great point to get started. All right, so what is the problem they were trying to solve? So what happens usually is the academic publisher Paris, academic rat race competing with each other and what is now or how researchers are currently measured is through citations and impact especially impact factor of the journals where they publish so what is the what is promoted right now is claim or science if you have an amazing shocking shocking result and you're able to publish it in nature or science then you know you will have kind of ensure your your career for the rest, uh, for the rest of your life, but in practice, the rush and the race for finding this glamour, glamorous result can cause um, 
basically something that is unwanted because the results are are searched you know at all costs and often uh, small effect sizes so phenomena that actually wouldn't be kind of statistically significant they get inflated or questionable research practices are used to once again inflate the results show that something new extremely new has just been discovered even though in practice uh, you know this just creates issues such as the publication bias and the reproducibility crisis that we are all aware of so that even though you are able to publish in natural science an amazing glamorous result in practice it's not replicable by others and in the end it slows down science and the whole scientific process for for the whole scientific community on top of that because of the incentives of being the first and being glamour there is the secrecy of the research process so that you can maintain the advantage so that you know your research group has the only knowledge to publish more amazing papers in nature science what should actually happen in the research process is that a research gap is identified a research gap is identified for example through a systematic literature review and an hypothesis is formed and then the planning stage start planning good data collection and good analysis and that that can basically answer to this hypothesis to this research question and this discussion this planning stage can actually happen with other scientists so kind of similar to what we do with the ethics committee with the ethical process where you revise your plan data collection plan and even analysis plan before actually collecting the data so before everything start you can plan plan exact detail what type of data will be collected what is the best analysis to answer the hypothesis the research question that you have and then once the community the scientific the, the experts in your field decide that this is the way to go you can just do what you promised to do and see if the result that you're getting is what you you know what you were hypothesizing or if you get the negative results and you know often answer always negative results are not glamorous it's very difficult to get them published but with this type of transparent process everyone would accept that it is a true negative negative result of course sometimes things might go wrong during the process and what was planned even though you didn't plan it alone even though you planned it with the experts in your field there might still be lessons learned on the way so there is still space for further explorations and reflection so that you can discover maybe alternative hypotheses and prepare the ground for the next for the next hypothesis to be tested and basically repeat of course in some cases it's difficult or maybe there is no way to create an hypothesis on a phenomenon that you study and it's fair then you are working with pure exploratory analysis but also this can still be transparently documented you can still discuss with the experts in your field what would be the best exploratory analysis to try with some new set of data that has never been seen before and then you know still be transparent and um, even though even though you you can't you are not able to tell in advance if you know if there is an hypothesis to test or what is there to be discovered so in general this overlaps a bit with what we discussed a couple of weeks ago in our uh, video for um, the responsible conduct of research the video is linked here and also the slides <clears throat> that there is basically a spectrum of uh, research practices from the good research practices where everything can be you know everything is idea the whole process is shared is uh, transparent with the experts in your field the best method are chosen together with the experts down to the extreme where you know falsification and fabrication are happening because you know the glamour the glamour result is more important than actual good good science i'm quoting myself here but if transparency would be the metric for being judged as a researcher rather than citations or the impact factor of the of the journal there would be no room for questionable research practices because now what what gets promoted is 
that you can show you know the full process from the thinking from the generation of the hypothesis down to the to the you know to the output to the to the publications to the published data set and to the published methods and then another quote from uh, chris chambers from the slides that i was mentioning that above that there's a paradox in um, in science because which part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist and it's the actual result because you don't want to influence the result you you absolutely don't want to bias the results that you get on the other hand which part of a research study do you believe is most important for advancing your career as a scientist and again it's the result so you don't want to bias the result you don't want to touch it you want to get it as close as possible to the truth but on the other hand you need it to be statistically significant or have some wow factor so that you can get it published in the most prestigious journal so register reports in a nutshell are basically similar to the process that i described above where at the beginning you develop an idea and you plan your study you plan it so well that you're basically writing the paper where you're writing the introduction section and all the methods and analysis section, really to the tiny details, which type of analysis will you do, which type of data and how will the data be, be, uh, be collected. Also, if it's applicable to your field, you can also collect the pilot data set so that you can estimate the power analysis. Um, with register report, they, they, they recommend having uh, statistical powers, so a power analysis of more than 90%. One might think that this is a bit of a too strict approach, but on the other hand, I understand why the suggestion is to basically look after strong effects sizes so that um, so that resources, reviewers and all this type of, uh, you know, even also the, the grants are not kind of wasted into effects that might not be there. Of course, it's also important to try to identify things that might not be there but maybe this should be more part of some sort of exploratory um, type of thinking and exploratory type of publishing. So then basically you submit your paper for peer review and this is the stage one peer review. So what happens here is that it's like you, you go through the review process that you would go normally but without having actually any data, without having any 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 results and of course without having the kind of discussion session of your of your paper. Then when kind of you and the expert in your field agree on what is the best data and the best methods <clears throat> to collect to answer the hypothesis that is trying to be that you're trying to be testing, then you get the in principle acceptance, which basically means that now at this stage, you just need to collect the data as you said that you were going to do it, analyze it exactly as you plan to analyze it, write the report and your paper is accepted. There is another peer review stage, but in practice, this is just checking that everything was done as promised in the in the in the stage one phase. So you understand that now, because the results or the significance and the glamour factor of the results is out of the way, it doesn't matter if you get the amazing result that you were expecting to get, or if you get nothing, because uh, in the end, the you and the and the reviewers agreed on the best way to to work on this and to answer this this question and to the best of your knowledge nobody you know you were not able for example to to find the statistical significance of course something wrong might come on the way maybe you and the reviewer might discover let's say a confounding factor that was not taken into account you can still run exploratory analysis you can still extend the paper with uh, you know some lesson learned which are still informative and uh, can be useful for generating new hypotheses and uh, iterating the, the research process so when it comes to the advantages of register reports well again citing chris chambers from one of these slides is that finally none of these four things matter anymore it doesn't matter if the hypothesis is supported or is not supported. It doesn't matter that your result reaches the magic, you know, small p-value smaller than 0 0.05. 
it doesn't matter if the result is novel or if you're just replicating something that already already exists. What it matters is that it's a very rigorous and detailed approach and very transparent approach, which makes it reproducible and which makes it more credible to other scientists because it's clear that it's not just you who came up with some data and some methods to test it. You discussed the best approach with other experts in your in your field. And so whatever the outcome, it's clear that there is no publication bias, bias, no inside bias, or no selective, selective reporting of the of the of the results that were found. So there are other advantages of register report because it's very important actually to get the expert reviewer feedback when it's most useful. And the most useful moment is before you collect the data, before you analyze the data. Imagine that you need to collect, I don't know, daily data for one year, and then you wouldn't get it kind of you you, you wouldn't first discuss with the experts in your in your field what is the best way to collect this type of data. You maybe collect 12 months of data, then go through the standard peer review process, and then some reviewer might point out actually that data is unusable because the, the researcher forgot something. What do you do? You spend another 12 months to collect a better data set. So maybe not, maybe it's better to get the expert reviewer feedback immediately before collecting the data, before analyzing the data, so that you know it's like more eyes are checking over the actual process and and the outcome is is the best as it as it can be. Register reports also have this advantage because the peer review and then in principle acceptance happens before collecting the data and before analyzing the data, you get a higher acceptance rate because with in principle acceptance, you just need to do what you promised. The paper is already accepted. Kind of. of course, some critics might say that by having already kind of the, the, the prize before doing the work, that the work that follows after might be might be you know conducted with less rigor but in practice this is not the case especially because there is still the state's to report you you still need to show that you collected the data as you promised that you analyzed it as you as you agreed with the reviewers so that you know if something didn't happen it needs to be clarified why why the data could not be collected as acted as it was promised to or or why not the analysis in general, so with register reports, is uh, kind of you know it's it's like more likely to get uh, accepted in the first journal where you where you submit because also the reviewers themselves they feel that they can improve the paper and contribute to the paper before the actual kind of data collection and 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 data analysis happens. Right, so register reports. There are now here plotted in green. This is a figure from the Nature paper from Chambers and um, from the end of last year. So register report are some sort of a land step, uh, some sort of a um, uh, subset of the landscape of pre-register research. Study pre-registration as you know, it's not something that is it's extremely new, has been going on for ages, like things like the clinical trials. Uh, website where you can register where all clinical trials should be registered or the open science frameworks with the idea of pre-registration is that it basically it's similar to register report you still register your idea and kind of the protocol of how you're planning to collect the data and you're planning to analyze the data but at this stage there's no peer review it's more like saying that you know writing what you promise that you will do or what you promised in your grant application that you will be doing and then uploading this, this plan into some website so that you get the timestamp. It doesn't have to be necessarily open because sometimes you might be working on, you know, on some new, on some new discovery so that, that you want to open later after you're, you're done your work. And this is also valid for registry report that they can still be kind of um, under an embargo that they can be open after when the whole process is over. But in general, with this, uh, with a simple pre-registration, you 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 don't get this uh, in principle acceptance because there's no peer review, and it's 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 more like you know 
an open and early documentation of the research, but kind of less binding than register report. Register report are a little bit more strict because not only there is a peer review happening before data collection and, uh, and before data analysis, you are also kind of, uh, how can I say, agreeing in the sharing of the code, sharing of the methods, the way you are sharing of the protocols, and you know as open as possible sharing of the data whether it's um, you know publicly shared if it's uh, data let's say that doesn't contain any personal data or ethical issues or data share through for example your organization data stewards and, um, and responsible people then there are other flavors of uh, pre-register studies in the paper in the nature paper that i'm linked here they are better explained especially the supplementary materials but for example here another flavor is this register replication reports where the focus here is on replication so not extending previous studies but exactly replicating some existing findings however the replication kind of before the replication happens before the work happens it's still peer reviewed with the with the community with the experts in your field so that everyone would agree what is the best data to replicate some past study and what is the best, what are the best methods. All right, so one might wonder, will register reports save us from questionable scientific practices? At least the preliminary, the preliminary findings show that um, in the same journal, if we compare the kind of traditional non-register report, papers that were submitted and the one with register reports, the percentages of null findings is much higher, whether they were replication register report or novel uh, questions, novel hypothesis register reports, the null findings are, you know, more than half of the findings reported in each of these papers is, was not significant compared to the kind of standard traditional way of publishing where basically only the significant things are reported and you know only 10 percent of the of the results in the traditional paper might be or was no no statistically significant and however of course it's good to question that you know will they really be helpful are they you know really truly improving the scientific progress the publishing process or is it just you know some extra extra work for for the sake of, of doing it so in the link that I have here, there's a nice uh, list of all sorts of misconceptions about register reports. And the usual question like, you know, is it slower to publish like this? Is it more work? On one hand, one might think that it is slower and it is more work. There are two rounds of peer review. But in practice, you know, I don't in, in practice, it's not any any slower. It's it's much slower to collect something without discussing with the with the community um, analyze it and then try to publish it in, a, in in one journal get it get it rejected try to fix it go to another journal and so on some people some people have raised the concern that by publishing something that is not significant so the null findings there might be a risk of not being cited but in practice, the data that we have so far on register report doesn't show that. So you can understand that a very rigorous study that shows a null finding has a strong credibility. And so you will get citations for showing that some effect that was believed until a few years ago is actually is actually null, is actually not 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 existing. So there is still kind of you know impact in this sense even though you're going to publish uh, null findings some people might have the fear of scooping because of course you open all your uh, ideas and plans before actually collecting the data and this can be a fair a fair concern especially if you think that you are working in a small organization you you might fear that your great idea and great plan gets stolen and then some other large organization can do everything in you know in few days what for you would might take in months but this is also goes with what i was mentioning earlier that you can still embargo the pre-registration you can still keep it closed you can still kind of share it only uh, keep it uh, confidential only with the editors 
and the reviewers and then after the the research is done all can be open the pre-registration the review process and and the final outcome and finally often people say that this fixing all the parameters in advance limits the creativity but in practice this is not true exploratory analysis are still very welcome because something can go wrong and something might be discovered on the way while doing it so you still have the freedom to add an exploratory analysis because you realize that by changing some parameters in whatever method you actually would have gotten the significant result there is also lots of criticism towards uh, register reports and in some sense it's um, it's uh, there are some good reasons for for this criticism in general there is this false sense of credibility if you're studying a phenomena that has no theory that it, it can't even be measured you know it's not that by wrapping it around the register report and a discussion with other people who believe in something that doesn't exist that's going to make it better so something that is based on bad theory and bad measurement is the register report is not gonna it's not gonna help you there or in general with phenomena that have a too small effect size if the effect size is so small you might actually be measuring noise and not and not the phenomena that you are thinking to measure so all this extra effort of going through multiple stages stages of peer review in the end might just be useless in uh, wikipedia there's a nice there's a nice list of all the criticism that um, that uh, register reports have have received but in general there is an answer for all the for all the criticism and the final answer is that this is just one strategy for being transparent in the whole scientific process there are other methods and i will cover them towards the end that we can still be transparent without necessarily using register reports so in practice if you know that you can be transparent if you know that you can open the whole part of the process from the generation of the idea to the final paper there's no you know there's no there's nothing to be worried that <clears throat> right so now to get a little bit more practical a researcher might start thinking are register report actually good for my research topic so in general um, register report are recommended for hypothesis driven fields hypothesis driven research so you know the when when it's clear that from previous studies this is quite common for example in the biomedical literature in the in the psychology and this type of field social sciences when you when you clearly can formulate an hypothesis that can be tested then uh, the register report becomes very useful for this you know to limiting for limiting the publication bias for avoiding the so-called p hacking so kind of this fishing expedition to to find the statistical significant using all sorts of method and also to fight for you know for not looking chasing phenomena that have a low statistical power or that the lack basically the possibility for replication so on the other end in general register report are not applicable for purely exploratory science you might receive a data set that is unique and there is no way to form an hypothesis before actually exploring the data and uh, and running all sorts of methods that you might still be working on the data or because maybe you're developing a new method that you can still compare to previous method but it's yet impossible to say if it will work or not however although register reports are not the kind of framework for this type of exploratory exploratory research it is still encouraged to pre-register even these exploratory ideas even pre-register with an embargo you might apply for a grant because you say that you want to develop a new method to solve some issue you can still pre-register the grant you can still pre-register the idea that would be driving this method before you actually do the work and uh, and eventually even get kind of you know feedback on this uh, on the on the on the process or even better kind of get a better feedback better than what you would have gotten let's say from your grant from your grant application so how do how do we get started with with the register reports so 
as you notice, because the, there is quite a, some stress on the statistical power. So when possible, it's good to collect some pilot data and run a power analysis to kind of estimate, let's say, how many participants you will need in your study or how many time points you will need for your time series to get an idea you know, that the phenomena that you are studying has enough power. Um, then there are templates available. I'm linking here the one from Nature Human Behavior. In practice, even though Nature Human Behavior is more related to you know, behavioral sciences, the template is very similar across all fields. It's, it's in practice having the introduction and the method section of your paper, and then a nice table where you can list all the hypotheses and all the outcomes from each hypothesis. There are, because now registered reports are basically available in any, any field of science, so it's good to see in, uh, in, the, in your field what people are, are writing and how registered reports have been, have been used. And of course, you know, the, this type of transparent approach to science also requires for you to share the code. Code, you know, can, it's not just about software code. Maybe I should rewrite it as protocols, methods, because all this also works for, for qualitative, qualitative research. You know, whatever you can kind of decide before collecting the data and before analyzing, analyzing the data. However, and this is the red box here, I think that transparency and openness in research, they require so much effort, so much extra efforts, you know, on top of the already huge amount of tasks that doctoral candidates and postdocs have. Because in practice, you know, it is the doctoral candidates and the postdocs who are gonna do all this extra work to make everything transparent and open. In general, and I'm talking of course to the person at Alto or the persons in the in the Nordics, we are here to help. All this is very overwhelming and it's simply difficult to quantify, you know, how much extra effort would be needed to make your methods open, open the protocol of your interviews or, you know, write a register report. So start with one step at a time and trust a peer community. If you don't have one peer community, we welcome you to the peer community across the whole Nordics, Nordic countries, code refinery. And you can find here a way how to join it and start interacting with other scientists like you. And if you're at Alto, of course, you're welcome to talk to us daily. We support anyone at Alto with whatever questions they come every day at 1 p.m. And we and we follow, you know, every school or most of the school have a data agent happy to discuss these issues with you. If we don't know the answer, most likely we know somebody who might know the answer. So it's 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 good to talk and to and to discuss. Research data data.fi is a very useful email address to ask anything about these issues. And if your issues are more methodological or software related statistics, then you can contact one of the research software engineers. We all hang around in the same in the same places. So you know you can just come out and ask for help because all this is very overwhelming and uh, you shouldn't suffer just because you decided to be transparent and open with your research. All right, finally, um, it's good to talk also some other options that I still believe are even better <laughs> than register reports because register reports, it, they're good, they're transparent. You get the peer review before doing the whole, the hard work. But um, some people could criticize that you and the reviewers might pick wrong methods to do the analysis. So the best way, in my opinion, and what I hope will be science in the future is the multiverse or multi-lab analysis. So this means that the same data or the same data collection protocol, if the data does exist here, is shared among many, many labs, many studies. In this um, paper from Nature from a few years ago, I was one of the 70 teams where all the 70 teams, they all got the same data set and they all got the same list of hypotheses to be tested. In this case, it was a neuroimaging data set. And, um, but everyone was allowed to use their own method. So you see that here, the different approaches that rather than discussing with the peer reviewers, what would be the best method, the best you know parameters to answer the hypothesis, here, 70 people, 70 different teams actually decided their own methods, what usually they use in their lab, 
what you know what is the best practice in the field and then at the end some sort of a meta-analysis across all the 70 teams result was was carried so what you see here in this figure is um, similarity metrics kind of the similarity for pairs of teams of, of one of the results so you know would, would basically mean that this cell here would be the similarity of the results from i don't know team number five and team number 30 all right so this big red square here it means that some some sort of 50 teams 70 percent of the teams actually got a very similar result so even though not a single team was using the same method there was always you know there was always a parameter that was different the majority of the team still found the same robust result however on the other hand it's also kind of somewhat scary to see that there is a percentage of teams that actually find the exact opposite result so you know if register report would have been used maybe you know one team of the register report would be in this cluster of the opposite result and the reviewers would say that everything is fine so you know we would not be able to discover all the other possible ways of analyzing the same data set so multiverse and multi-lab analysis definitely would be great but you of course you understand that now suddenly you know it's not your paper <laughs> it's 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 an effort with uh, hundreds of other authors but maybe this is how science should, should go forward that we shouldn't price the the single small labs but we should just work in large large consortium and large research groups there are other practices one is blind analysis which actually comes from uh, astrophysics if i remember correctly and there the idea is that um, i mean it's not that new even in the in the medical field that it's like the you know the double blind analysis that when you analyze let's say the outcome of a clinical trial you don't know the labels you don't know which subject was in the placebo group and which was was in the treatment group you just then because of of not knowing the labels you have no idea if you're going to bias the analysis towards the placebo group or towards the the treatment group so with blind analysis the labels of the data the labels of the hypothesis are hidden from those who will analyze the team um, analyze the data and this hopefully you know reduces some sort of bias that might be that might that we might put in the results that we want to obtain another um, technique which is similar more closely related to the multi-lab is the uh, multiverse is the cross lab replication so that you conduct the study and you collect the data and analyze it and then you join effort with another lab who are just told you know this is how we collected the data and this is you know what we tested these were our hypotheses so that another group another research group would basically replicate your findings with a different data set and maybe even with a different with a different method and then an interesting one, although I've seen it very rarely, is the adversarial collaboration so that you have a search hypothesis and another research group as the opposite hypothesis. So you both kind of, I wouldn't say fight, but you both collaborate together, even though you believe in two different, in two opposite views. And then you try to identify a common data set and a common approach methodological approach to basically see where where is the truth which which one had had it right all right so we are basically done and there's enough time for discussion i recommend to check the references they are here at the beginning and if you want to improve this page please comment or you can contact me